She loudly demanded to know where her Sunday edition was. Ma'am said the employee, today is Saturday. The Sunday paper will not de be delivered until Sunday. Quite a pause on the other end of the phone. And she said, so that's why there was no one in church today. <laughs> I know a man in this church who got all dressed up and put a suit on on a Saturday. I know a man. The man I know that did that isn't in the house today. So that, that narrows it down to a couple of people, doesn't it? I won't mention John's name. <laughs> Wouldn't mention John's name. First Chronicles chapter 11, starting with verse 22. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant fighter from Kabzeel, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down an Egyptian who was five cubits tall. Although the Egyptian had a spear like a weaver's rod in his hand, Benea went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benea, son of Jehoiada. He too was as famous as the three mighty warriors. He was held in greater honor than any of the 30, but he was not included among the three, and David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, as we have this opportunity to carry these morsels from your word to the family in the house today, I pray that you would anoint this word, that you would direct it to where you want it to go, and it will have the effect that you want it to have in Jesus' name. Amen. This Jehoiada was the high priest. And Benaiah, so that means Benaiah was, that means he was a Levite. And since his father was a priest and the high priest, Benaiah was probably also trained in the priesthood. He was a powerful warrior. He was a killer in a good way, you know, like SEAL Team 6 or the Delta Force. You're always glad those people on our side. And uh, if I'd have been around in those days, I would be glad that Benea was on our side. But he did kill his enemies. He killed Moab's two mightiest warriors. They were the best that Moab had, the two best, and he killed them he also killed an Egyptian giant, seven and a half feet tall. And Benaiah went against him, not with a sword, not with a spear, not with a bow and arrow, but with a club. And he took the giant's spear away from him and killed him with it. That is one tough guy, a tough guy. Not the sort of thing, the guy that you think of as doing priestly duties, but... He was a tough man. He was a brave man. He was, you know, going after big guys all by himself. Going after a lion all by himself. Lions kill you. They want you dead and they want you for lunch. That's what lions do. And a lion usually wins. 500 pounds of muscle. Big sharp claws, a loud roar. The lion can tear you apart. It can crush your skull with one chomp. And David, King David had killed both a lion and a bear. Usually the lion wins. And this guy, Benea, he was famous. He was well known for his exploits. He was in charge of David's bodyguard. And he was one of the most respected officers in David's employ. The pit, you know, we don't exactly know what the pit was. In some places they dig pits and it's a pitfall trap to trap animals. 
This could have been one of those, a pit like that. We don't know. It doesn't say. But it must have been deep enough that the lion wasn't able to jump out of there. It must have been steep-sided, hole in the ground. Maybe it was man-made. We don't know. But it seemed like the lion wasn't able to get out of there, out of the pit. So once in the pit, Benaiah killed the lion. He had no choice. If you're in a hole in the ground with a lion and you don't kill the lion, then the lion's going to kill you. Amen? Amen. He's going to kill you. So it was kill or be killed. And Benaiah, in true hero fashion, went after the lion. And it was on a snowy day, to make matters worse, this took place on a day when there wouldn't be good footing. The footing would have been terrible. Can you imagine slipping around, facing a lion in, in, a, in a steep sided hole in the ground? Can you imagine? And the lion is fully equipped to kill you. And, and, and he's better equipped to hold his ground than you are because you don't have any claws. Can you imagine? If you try to get out of the pit, try to climb up, you, you'd have your back to the lion. And then he's got you. Lunch for the lion. Wow. In the, in the natural, he, you'd think he had a lot of things against him and not too much going for him. Now this lion may have carried off a child. This lion may have been raiding livestock. No lion is a benign character here, kitty, kitty. They don't come up to you wanting to be petted. Lions that get too close to people and to villages are, are a threat. In the wild, lions pursue game. They pursue wild animals. This lion was definitely a threat, or Benaiah wouldn't have thought it necessary to risk his life to kill it. So Benaiah attacked the lion. David had done such things. If we would have been there, we would think Benaiah to be out of his mind. But if he hadn't gone after the lion, maybe the lion would eventually escape from the pit and harm or kill someone else. Benaiah neutralized the threat. That was his way of doing. That was his nature. And we have people in our military like that. They're trained to run to the danger. If we lived in those days, we would be glad that Benet was on our side. Nobody could go up against him. The two best warriors of Moab tried, and the two best warriors of Moab died. The Egyptian giant tried, and the giant died. The lion tried, the lion died. Can you or I be a Benaya? Does the lion represent the devil? I don't think so, not really, because the lion died. We can have victory over the enemy, but he's still there. Ken, they got me that for Pastor Appreciation Day. They used to make me beg for amens, and I just pushed this button. Huh? It didn't come on. It was working earlier. Well, it has batteries. Maybe it needs batteries. Well, anyway, where was I? So, the enemy is still there looking for a place to probe, to poke you. Can we think of the lion as a representative of sin? I think so, most definitely. We can and do kill the sin that separates us from God. When we move toward God through the blood of Jesus, our sin is cast into the sea of God's forgetfulness. And that sin can harm us no more. But we can get back in. 
with another sin because the devil never, never stops, never takes a rest, never goes on vacation, never sleeps. So we emerge from the pit. We have a clean slate at that point. How were we able to do that? Somebody was in a pit with us. The greatest warrior that ever lived was in the pit with you. When you slew that lion, the greatest warrior that ever lived was there with you. Defeating the worst enemy that ever lived. Jesus to the rescue. He paid the penalty for your sins with his blood, with his death on the cross. Jesus is the ultimate hero. Was God with Benaiah? I think so. With God's help, he was able to do great things, things that seem impossible, things not on his own strength. Only with God's help can we defeat the attacks of the enemy. Benaiah had to kill the lion or it would get the best of him. And we have to kill the sin that so easily besets us. Colossians 3, 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever, be, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Finish the lion. Put sin to death. We could apologize for our sins. I'm sorry, Lord. But sometimes we don't repent of them. To repent is to act differently. To repent is to turn around. In repentance, we turn from going our way, our own way, and we turn towards God and start going God's way. We turn from the enticements of the world, which there are plenty of, and move toward God's will. He has a will for each person. He has a plan for each person. Repentance, killing the lion, is a change deep in the heart where you move away from that sin and towards God. Sometimes we stop doing the sin, but we harbor the desire of it in our hearts. Then you have to finish the lion. You got to finish that lion. You got to kill it. Colossians 3, 7 to 8. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. That was verse 7. So you used to be in the pit. You lived in the pit. The sin pit was your life before you encountered Jesus. Your life changed, and now you're living for God. Verse 8, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Rid yourselves. Kill the lion. So you know what the lions are in your life. They're different for each of us. You know what the besetting sins are in your life. The fiery darts that keep coming back. What lion do you need to chase? It's different for each one of us. The lion of anger. The lion of habits the lion of gossip, the lion of jealousy or envy, the lion of excuses, and there are so many more. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So we need to identify the pit world standards versus God's standards. This thing still doesn't work, does it? <laughs> oh, well, it probably needs a battery. Um, the standard that is a pit today is one of man's opinion. 
kings and emperors have come and gone, presidents and governments, once powerful and renowned, have long been forgotten. Churches have come and gone. But one thing has remained unchanged, God's standard. The Word. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Psalm 33, 4, for the Word of the Lord is right, and all His works are done in truth. That's God's standard, is the Word. The standard of popular opinion said it's all right to do what you want to do because everybody else is doing it. Or if it doesn't hurt anybody, it's okay. After all, why should you be different than everybody else? That's the world standard. Television broadcasts these standards right in to our living rooms daily, and we don't even know it. Social media is even worse. I stay off of social media. Believers are, believers are filling their minds with popular opinion. But below the surface, Satan is doing a masterful job of teaching us and our children that they can and should be willing to try or to do anything and nothing is too outlandish if enough people are willing to go along with it. Popular opinion, that is a pit. The standard of popular opinion preaches to the believer, just go with the flow. Just go with the flow. First Peter 2, 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We haven't been called to follow trends. We have been called to set the trend. It's time to bring a holiness back. I'm not talking about touch not, eat not, act not. I'm not talking about that as holiness. I'm talking about how we, you know, how we act and how we love people. And we love people as ourselves, as commanded in the word. Then the things we do will fall in line as well. Holiness is moving towards God. It's a gradual process called sanctification. It's moving towards God and away from the standards of the world. What we think affects what we do. And what we think could be a pit with a lion in it. You'll always regret lions that you don't finish. <laughs> the lion wants to kill you. The lion of sin wants to destroy you. It wants to separate you from God. It wants to destroy the work of God in you. Lust seems good for a season, then it overtakes you and you lose control. Sin will always promise you a life that it can't deliver on. Romans 8, 37, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Finish the lion. Remember that your external circumstances can't handle your internal power. You have, if you have a life devoted to God and prayer, that is your first language, not gossip, and the Spirit of God lives inside of you, then, 1 John 4, 4, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So we have to remember that we're not trapped with the lion. The lion is trapped with you. <laughs> 
You're not trapped with the lion. The lion is trapped in you. Switching your perspective puts you in control, not your sin. How many others is this lion harming? Your sin can bring harm to others. Who else can help you find freedom when, you're, when you've conquered your lion? Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy without holiness. No one will see the Lord. So what do we have to do? Finish the lion and be holy. And be holy. Is that hard to do? No, with God's help. If we want to do it with God's help, we can do it. We can. It's a matter of sanctification. It's a matter of being able to say no to the enticements of the world. To have a shield against the fiery darts of temptation and saying no to them. The more you do that, the stronger you get to do it. I mean, just because we're believers and we accepted Christ as our Savior doesn't mean we're not tempted. I wish I could get this thing to work. <laughs> it doesn't mean we're not tempted, but it means we have the means to kill that lion. Kill it. Would you stand with me? Dear God, this morning I ask your blessings on every person that's in the house here today. Uh, I pray that this, uh, this short sermon, Lord, that you gave me will be um, a powerful witness into the lives of the believers here today, Lord. And if there would be any in the house today that are away from you or haven't been, you know, that are away from God, I pray this would be a moment when they kill a lion today, Lord. We all need to kill lions, and we have to keep doing it. And, and we trust it in your ability to help us with that, Lord. So we just ask your blessings on the congregation. We ask you to, to, um, to stimulate us, Lord, to, to conquer the lion and also to go out and help other people to conquer their lions and then bring them in here and help us with our worship, Lord, and our, and our numbers, Lord. So we, you know, we just give this to you, Lord. We just offer it to you. It's all, it all belongs to you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. I stand at your door and knock this morning. If any man would let me in, I desire to come in and sup and dine and commune with you, to have sweet fellowship with you. But I say to you this morning, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But I say to you, first of all, you must open that door and let me in. For I desire good things for you. I desire to prosper you. I desire to bless you. I desire to have you into my kingdom, my kingdom forever and ever. And I say to you, uh, come on to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest this morning. And I say to you this morning, keep your eye fixed on me, the author and finisher of your faith. Keep your hand fixed steadfast to the plow. And I say to you this morning, come, come unto me. Come unto me, all you who are laden and heavy laden. I will give you rest this morning. So that is an invitation from Jesus himself. That's an invitation. So that means he knows there are those that need to move away from sin in their life. There are those here. So if that's you, come on down here. Just come on down and, and let us pray with you. If, that's, if, if there's anybody in here that away from God or there's a friction between you and God or there's, and there's problems in your life that you can't, haven't been able to overcome, come on down here. That's, that's the invitation. Okay. Have a seat for a minute. I got to ask you about something.
want to ask you about a 